Surprise, surprise, Creativity in Focus back just for you. Yes, you are watching Creativity in Focus, a live video podcast where we interview artists and we show their art and talk about the process. We talk about the business. We talk about everything, actually. And today is no different. Uh, today, my guest is Michael Marks, and we are going to have a blast. So if you're watching this live, you have a very special chance to ask questions live to Michael and he will answer directly to you. So the best way to do that is by using the chat box below the video. That's the best place for you to do that. Submit your questions and I'll ask him and he will answer directly to you. And that is a very cool thing. And don't forget to share this podcast. This is content only. That thing will be sold here. So you're safe to post on social media, on the groups, uh, in the groups as well. Uh, you can share on all the social media platforms. Tag, give a hashtag to Creativity in Focus a podcast there and you know just share that because there's only information and you never know when this information can inspire somebody to start a new journey so don't forget that okay welcome michael how are you doing Thank you. i'm doing great very thanks for cool. having me i'm really excited to be here yes I'm, I'm glad you you made it and i know you had a very busy day today uh, but you know you found some extra time hey to come you know talk to any any chance to sort of share my work with people and tell yes. them about it and explain what I do. So I appreciate the opportunity. So first of all, tell me, how, what, how did you get started with arts? Well, I've been an artist as long as I can remember. Okay. Um, I was raised in a household where we were given art supplies as much as we were given books or toys. We were encouraged to draw. Um, I was lucky to grow up in an area where the schools were heavily funded towards the arts all the way through high school. Um, so that a lot of the arts education I got at the high school level, many of my friends didn't get till they went off to art school. Oh. Um, I moved from where I grew up in Massachusetts to California at 18. Uh, I actually put my art aside for about four years because I just started working. Okay. And so about four years after I'd moved there, somebody gave me some polymer clay, which is something Ooh. I hadn't seen since I was a kid. Uh-huh. And... All of a sudden, I started sculpting again and working in, in polymer clay and then slowly but surely adding in mixed media and working in wood and found materials. And uh, at one point in my late 20s, I put together a show and rented a gallery for a weekend and put on a show and sold one piece. And I was happy with that. <laughs> um, in uh, the next year, a friend of mine who is a really accomplished artist came to me one day and said, there's this class in something called metal clay, and it's a clay, and when you fire it, it turns to metal. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, this is kind of like the old snake oil ads uh -huh. of the Old West, right? You know, this tonic will cure baldness and cancer and strip yeah. paint. And um, I went off to the class, and it was an introduction to precious metal clay with Hadar Jacobson, who is one of the original sort of instructors in metal clay. And I was hooked. Nice. Um, that was in about 2001, and I've been doing it ever since. I still do occasionally work in mixed media and wood, but I am most of the time and, and most of my focus is spent in metal clay. Um, and is this your, your full-time job or part-time so thing? So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through that because that's a great question. I was uh, a personal trainer for 20 years uh, to support the art habit. Uh, the art was a hobby that started to create some income. Um, I met my wife, we got married, we had a son, and three and a half months into being a new dad, I became a full-time stay-at-home dad. And personal training kind of backed down to some pretty minimal hours. And um, after doing that, uh, by the time my son was two and a half, I was pretty much done with personal training. And that actually dovetailed perfectly into teaching metal clay. Okay. So uh, in terms of metal clay, I hold four different certifications. There were some original certifications through PMC Connection. Mm -hmm. So I was level one and level two certified. And then Camp PMC, which is the newest organization, I have uh, uh, basically a 101 and 201 certification. Okay. And then a lot of it is just creating my own curriculum based on people's interest in my work. And right. What's nice is the, the background I had in personal training, teaching people how to exercise correctly, absolutely translated beautifully into oh, really? teaching metal clay. 
the interesting thing about teaching is it's kind of like sales. Yes. The, the content doesn't matter, right? If, I, if I'm trained in sales, I could sell you that laptop, I could sell you insurance, I could sell you this building. Uh -huh. When it comes to teaching, if you know how to teach, the material becomes irrelevant because uh, the philosophy I have for teaching is tell, show, do. And so I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you how to do it, and then we're going to do it. Yeah. And if people need to check back in during the do process, the nice thing is they can see me go through it or I can help them through the the, the sticking points. And that, it's it's wonderfully rewarding because in personal training, the challenge was is it could take weeks, months, or years to reach a goal. In a metal clay class, it usually takes only a couple of days. A couple of days, yes. So... And, and the success rate is far higher than in personal training. Uh, I think if personal trainers are truly successful, they have to always be chasing new clients because uh -huh. their best clients obviously got what they wanted out of the experience. With uh, Metal Clay, there's something wonderful that it creates repeat students mm -hmm. because they want to move on to that next level or that next project yes. or that next design or they want to start exploring stuff that goes beyond their comfort level. So. It becomes a... a Irrational passion. Yes. Right? And when people have irrational passion for something, they go, they invest, they they dedicate themselves. Yes. Okay. So you told. Now let's show. Yes, absolutely. Right? So I, I I bet they you you're really okay. But I want to see what kind of stuff he's making. <laughs> so you're going to see a few of his pieces right now, and he's going to tell you uh, what inspired him and the process. So let's see the first one. So that one is sideways, which is okay. This is actually what's going to be taught in the class next month, which is the kinetic fish. Uh -huh. So what it is, is this is a slightly flatter version. The body would normally have a curvature to it. I built this one flat. And um, it actually is the largest fish I've made. It's quite a statement piece. Uh -huh. It incorporates a piece of dichroic glass in the eye, which we won't do in class, but I can add in sort of some instructive ways to how people can eventually learn to do that. It's one of my favorite pieces because of the amount of movement in the fins and in the tail. Uh-huh. And, really uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely not something you uh, just throw on with a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. It's <laughs> definitely designed to go with something nice. more uh -huh. fanciful. Sophisticated. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see another one. So that's the, another one of the fish. This lacks the kinetic element because the tail is fixed to the body, mm. but it very much sort of follows my aesthetic, which uh, somebody once asked me to describe what my style is, and I say that it's rock and roll deco. <laughs> I have an absolute passion for the beautiful clean lines and a lot of the aesthetics of the art deco era, uh -huh. but I also have a lot of passion for sort of uh, vintage rock posters and a lot uh -huh. of that imagery, uh -huh. and I like to kind of mash that up. So I want to give you something that has really clean lines and really bold, but instead of it just being something you know, very sculptural, it might be a skull, it uh -huh. might be a bug, it might be a fish, but I want it to have kind of that crossover. Nice, nice. Let's see one more. Ah, the fish. Uh, that is a kinetic fish, uh -huh. and the neat thing with that one is that it can be worn because of how the bales were designed, either hanging from the tail or hanging from a hidden bale behind the lips. Oh. So it's reversible. Oh. And it was the first of a couple of fish that I did with a non-traditional scale pattern. Uh -huh. Instead of a sort of three-dimensional raised scale, it's more of a abstract scale pattern. That's very cool. One more. That's the same piece hung in the other orientation. Uh -huh. So uh, that is something I will cover in class for people who want to be able to do it. The only trick is, is you have to kind of have a chain with a finding that can fit through both sets of jump rings without needing to take a pair of pliers and modify the chain. Mm -hmm. So that's the only consideration in that design, but it, it's something we will cover. That's exciting. Now, before we talk more about jewelry, you were telling me, that, uh, about a very unique experience you had in your life as a personal trainer. So uh, when I was working uh, in Oakland, California as a personal trainer, I was working one day and I got called down to the front desk and I met a young woman who was from California but had spent most of her life in sub-Saharan Africa in a country called Botswana. And she said she was looking for a personal trainer to come and set up and run a gym for them for a year. And so at first I thought about the job and 
thought I would ask friends and then realized that I was probably the best candidate for the job. So I put in my application and three months later, I hopped a plane and spent a year in sub-Saharan Africa setting up and running a gym. So I got to spend a year abroad working and living in a completely different country and experiencing everything that it had to offer. And it was really amazing. So this time that you spent there, of course, uh, it, it's a country that also has uh, a lot of uh, art history and yes. very strong colors. Do you think that has influenced your work at all? I think a lot of the patterns did. I think the thing that blew me away the, the most was the basket weaving uh -huh. and the intricate patterns and geometric patterns that could be woven into the baskets. Uh, a lot of the scenery also influenced my work because it's yes. vast, wide open spaces. Certainly the fact that you know wild animals were as, as common as squirrels and pigeons are here. So you saw a lot more wildlife at your doorstep than you would in, wow. let's say, suburban California. So it was really amazing. Well, you get, you get your bobcats in California every now and then. Yeah, not in Alameda. We do have some wild turkeys. So Alameda is kind of funny in that it's an island. So the turkeys actually had to cross a bridge or go through a tunnel to get to us. But they walk across my front lawn every so often, and that's a nice touch. So so you, you, you are focused on the metal clay, or do you play with other things? In so I just meaning? recently started making my own dichroic glass cabs for use in the metal clay. In fact, the class I taught yesterday and today here in Salt Lake City was a metal clay and glass class, and the students used glass that I had made myself, mm -hmm. and it adds an element to color. Um, I make mixed media mounts for my pieces, and the best way to explain it is that they are non-religious reliquaries. So in uh, the religious sense, a reliquary is where a religious relic is held when it's not out for the congregation. So these are ornate cabinets, uh, usually very heavily gilded, very beautiful. And um, I wanted to make sure that the pieces that I spend sometimes 20 or 30 hours on weren't languishing in a uh, jewelry box not seen because rather than jewelry, I really do consider my work to be wearable sculpture. Mm -hmm. So I make for some of my higher end pieces, uh, mostly wood, but some mixed media mounts so that when you're not wearing a piece of jewelry, you have a place to keep it on the wall. And so you have both a, the reliquary as a piece of art and the jewelry, which can either be a worn piece of sculpture or a mounted piece of sculpture. That is very cool. That's very cool, the approach you take to this. Uh, now, you work with metal clay, and you mentioned that you, you give classes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, do you also sell the pieces? And if yes, so, I where do. do you do that? Uh, so the majority of sales are through my website, which is unsaneart.com, which is U-N-S-A-N-E-A-R-T.com. And I also sell through a local bricks and mortar store in my hometown called Feathered Outlaw. And uh, those are the two primary places. So, yeah. That's very cool. Let's take a look at some other yeah. pieces that you have made. So that is a different fish than the traditional kinetic fish in that the movement is actually not in the fish itself, but in the hook that the fish is hanging from. And that piece is about six inches long. So it is another showstopper, sort of more of a non-subtle piece. But it contains all the hallmarks of my traditional kinetic fish, three-dimensional scales, textured fins and tail, oversized three-dimensional eyes, big pouty lips. And uh, that one is called Lourdes. That's my coelacanth. That was the first fish I did where I, instead of a plain texture on the face, there's actually a secondary texture on the face. Mm -hmm. There's a third texture around the eye, and then, of course, the fins all have their own textures. That was just an attempt to sort of add a splash of color to an earlier kinetic fish. That's close. Very, that is actually very much what we'll be covering in class, again, just without the glass. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of the flower pieces that I did um, that is one of my all-time favorite pieces. So that's a three-dimensional flower, and the bale is actually a hollow log that the chain passes through. That's gorgeous. 
Dragonfly. Uh, that was a challenging piece just in terms of getting the wings to stay put long enough to dry. Okay. Uh, multiple layers of texture. That's actually the next class I'm teaching Saturday and Sunday here in Salt Lake City. It's my bugs class. Uh -huh. I've been on an insect kick for a couple of for, years now. Okay, good. And uh, I love doing the insects. Does this one move at all? No. Um, the problem is, is that if there's movement, there's no way to keep the wings in one position. Uh -huh. So they would fall down and not stay up. Oh. I do some bugs where the elytra, which are the body panels, swivel open and closed. Uh -huh. So that there's sort of a, they move a little when you're wearing it. And then somebody will say, hey, can you show me what's on the body panel? Uh -huh. And so you can manually just open the, oh. open the elytra and show people what's on it. That's very cool. Now, I want to remind you before we go to, to the next one, uh, I want to remind you that we are live. And if you're one of the lucky few people there, that have found this right now and say, oh my gosh, look what's here. Michael Marks is here. You can ask questions to him. Yes, below the video, there's always the comment box. Well, that's the right place that you submit your question. I'll get here and I'll ask him. He will answer directly to you. Don't let this chance pass you by. So if you have any questions, this is the right moment for you to ask. We have a few comments here. Uh, Holly Ginsberg Gage, way to go, Michael. <laughs> Hi, Holly. <laughs> Be uh, Betty Eagles, gorgeous work. Thank yes. you. Now, how long it takes you, on average, to make one of these pieces? That's a really hard question. Uh, and the only reason is, is it completely depends on the complexity of a piece. A simple piece can take an hour or two, some of the more complicated pieces that we've been showing have 20 or 30 hours. Um, it's not always continuous work. In metal clay, there's a lot of stages of making an element, drying it, refining it, attaching it, drying it some more. But you know, the, the more complicated the piece, the longer it takes. And obviously, if it's the first time I'm making a particular design, I'm still in the process of hashing out all the details. Uh, did I like the way this came out? And one of the things I discuss with my student is, students sorry, is that a lot of my work follows a rule of threes, that the first iteration, the first version of a piece is really a maquette. It's a three-dimensional sketch to just get the general idea down. And then in the second version, there's more elaboration, right? Another layer of detail. It gets bigger usually. It gets more complicated. It gets more interesting. And then by the third version, I'm not worried about the construction elements. I'm not worried about the basic form anymore. So all I do is push the design as far as I can take it. So uh, for example, the octopus piece I'm wearing really is a third level uh, piece of jewelry. And this is one that I did in... Um, one fire PMC 950. So this is a single stage firing sterling. Uh, the tentacles actually that face forward, the texture was all hand pierced one dot at a time onto a te uh, texture to create the suckers on the tentacles. And uh, it's hollow from the back so that it's nice and light. And this was the master. And then we cast it in a numbered limited edition in sterling silver. Uh, Laura is saying, hi, Michael. I love taking hi, your class yesterday and today. <laughs> oh, cool. Good to see you, Laura. <laughs> Michael, you, you mentioned that, uh, the pieces that you're making, and you mentioned a few places that you sell. Do you also take commissions? Or Absolutely. Not? I love taking commissions because uh, that process for me means that the piece is incredibly personal for the person who's receiving it. Uh, there's uh, friends of mine, Michael and Constance, they commissioned matching pieces for one another uh, of what they called the time in a bottle piece. And it was a bottle with a cutaway that showed a clock and a skull and a heart. And I did two of those for them. And that, that you know, my pieces have meaning to me and my customers attach their own meaning to those pieces. Commissions, on the other hand, that meaning starts with the client and I get to make it come to life. So that is really important to me. Would, would it be fair to say that one thing that attracts you uh, intensely to the metal clay is, is the storytelling that comes with it? Absolutely. I love doing pieces that are considered narrative in nature so that they, they have a story or they evoke an emotion. I think um, the problem is, is that we tend to look to two-dimensional art 
as mediums that um, can make a statement beyond just something aesthetically pleasing. And I think jewelry can do the same thing mm -hmm. and sculpture can do the same thing. And it's just, it tends not to be the medium that gets the, the most exposure for, for telling stories. Mm -hmm. um, I'm seeing it more and more now, but uh, yeah, I, I, want, I want there to be a reaction, whether it's positive or negative. I certainly don't mind negative criticism on my pieces if people are offended by it or bothered by it or it's not their cup of tea. That's okay, but I, I want to know that it's creating emotion and reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenny is asking, where do you draw inspiration from the most? Wow, uh, that's one of my favorite questions. I'm a visual sponge. Um, I think every art exhibition I've been to, every book I've read, every comic book I've picked up, certainly uh, I think it's one of the best things about social media is my exposure to other people's work, but also photos of things and places from around the world that otherwise were hard to access. Um, and it's, it's just the way I'm wired. I, I think if I was just a pair of eyes and a brain floating through the world, that would be all I'd need. Uh, the fact that I get to take that visual input and turn it into something dimensional and, and, and physical rather than just theoretical is very meaningful for me. That's very cool. Jacob is saying, your octopus is sweet. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Have you watched the documentary, uh, My Teacher, the Octopus? Yes, my octopus teacher actually yes. just watched it this last week. Oh, really? And uh, thought that that was one of the most incredible stories I've ever seen about an interaction between two vastly different species, yes. but that shared a common bond and obviously some love and a lot of passion on the side of the human and, and some real interest on the side of the octopus. I mean, they're amazing creatures, so. That's very cool. Yeah. I loved it. I think it was a, a great uh, storytelling. Yes. Uh, very well done. And also the, the, the video footage underwater was just breathtaking. Yeah. Yes, it was, it was. Now, talked about storytelling and I can see just, you know, we, uh -huh. we, we've been talking for months uh, but it's the first time we're right. interacting uh, face to face, and I can see you were a storyteller. I think mm -hmm. I think that that really translates into that, which is very cool, right? Uh, now going back to the pieces, do you you use the metal clay always in silver, or do you play with other metals? As so well? I've worked with the base metal clays. Uh, I, there's there's definitely something I love about the color of them. The hard part for me as a working artist who really does want to sell their work is you put in just as much labor into copper or bronze, but the problem is, is you can never sell it for as much. And unfortunately, with silver prices being what they are, <laughs> and my labor being as lengthy as it is, I need to kind of maximize that amount. Um, so I prefer to use things like glass to add color. Um, the other thing that I found is, is bronzes and coppers are a harder market to find. Not as many people wear jewelry made in those base metals. I personally, as I'm doing it, when there's more time sort of to just play, I want to start working with maybe some small scale non-wearable sculptures in the base metals because I think there's tremendous things to be done that way without having to resort to casting. Do you, do you make a lot of those? Make a lot of... Uh, that, that when you want to play non-wearable? You know, I don't really. <laughs> I don't really, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, for me... Uh, I get so locked into uh, making things in silver that my other exploration of sort of something sculptural is I like to play with Lego. I have a, <laughs> I have a son. He's 13. We've been doing Lego since he was little. Oh, uh, I still uh -huh. build things today. So, uh, And then my wife got into painting rocks uh, with oh. dot patterns. And so sometimes... When I need a break from all of the sculptural elements, I'll paint rocks she with like her. She does mandalas with dogs. So, yeah, oh, and cool. then she hides them around the neighborhood for people to find. She writes, <laughs> oh, you yeah. rock on the back. Uh -huh. And she's done over 200 in the last year. Really? So, yeah, and there's, she's only kept three. So, yeah, uh, you know, we have here, we have the 801 rocks. Yes. So it's the same concept, right? So the other day, uh, we were in Yellowstone, and we went to look into an old train cabin. 
and Nashla found one from <laughs> here. <laughs> so yeah, this, and you know, again, they tell stories, they have a meaning of the place you found them. That's a very cool thing. You mentioned prices, and you know that people, sometimes they see something and say, I, yeah. I, I think I could go that route. I think right. I could embark in that journey. And many, many of us, we just want the pleasure of being able to have a challenge and, and right. at the end have a piece of art. But others, they always think about, okay, but there's the other side. Maybe I could be making some extra money. And right. in, in moments like we are living right now, this is fast becoming a reality for a lot of people. I need some yeah. extra cash. So give us a, 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 an overview of prices. It doesn't have to be what you sell for because, of course, you've been in this market for a while. And you're, you're known, so it's a different ball game. But give but us I a try. sense. So that's a great question, and I really appreciate that because there's part of it that sometimes people will come up and look at the work and look at the price tag, not ask any questions, mm -hmm. not really look at it closely, and they, they're scared by the, the price. Yeah. Most people who then engage and ask questions once they find out the amount of work that goes into it and wh how it's made and that I'm not just buying buying something to resell, would do say, it's out of my price range, but I really love it. Or I get a lot of people who are like, I'm saving for that. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is, is that I do try to have something on the lower end and then stuff that is quite high end. So some of my lower end pieces might be in the 40 to $50 range. Um, I do with certain pieces like the octopus, um, I'll do a master and we'll cast them. And that allows me to offer a particular design at a lower price point than if it's an original. Okay. Um, but on the higher end, I have $650 pieces out there um, because the amount of silver, but also the amount of work that went into it. And you know, there's something for everyone, I hope, you know. Uh -huh. um, I definitely have people who fall in love with my work, and it's really nice that they like the whole body of work mm -hmm. and then can find the one piece that both speaks to them and is something they can afford. Uh -huh. Well, I like, uh, I also think that how you present things uh, change the perception of value. And yes. like you said, you, you create your pieces so when they are not uh, to be aware, they have a special place to be. So you're already... Translate that story that this is everything but a pendant. This is yes. a piece of art, and you know you have to have care, but respect with that as well, right? Yes. And I think that also plays a factor when you ask for whatever you ask. Uh, Jenny's saying, on average, how much time do you dedicate to each piece, and when is it officially done? When do you consider it done? I love that question. So can you ask the first half again? Uh, on average, how much time you, you dedicate on to each piece? It's entirely dependent on the piece. A skull, I can, a simple skull can be done from beginning to end in about an hour mm -hmm. because I've got, I've done enough of them. I have my templates to do the cutting. I have the draping forms to do the draping. What adds extra time usually is surface embellishments of bow, uh, horns, uh -huh. things like that. Um, some of the bugs have 20 or 30 hours. Um, how do I know when a piece is done? That's a good question. I think uh, some pieces follow what I call the giggle factor. And I'm, it's telling a story on myself. It's going to make me seem like another crazy artist. <laughs> but I'll be working on a piece and I'll literally start giggling to myself because uh -huh. I'm so happy with the fact that what I was thinking of, the, the vision in my head, has translated so beautifully in three dimensions. Um, unlike a lot of artists, I do almost no sketching. Okay. If I do sketches, they're usually reference sketches where you wouldn't even look at the drawing part of it and understand what I'm trying to convey. It's notes on construction or thoughts about method or so that I can refer back to that because those are the 2 a.m. I can't sleep. I need, mm -hmm. oh, that <laughs> idea occurred <laughs> yeah. to me or you know, driving through traffic and I'll literally pull over and write some, I, I have two that I wrote on the bottom of a Kleenex box, you know, in the van, you know, kind of uh -huh. thing. So um, I, I can look at a piece and tell that it's done when it feels right. It feels like I've, all the edges are clean. All of the little mistakes have been filled in. You know, typically I won't engrave my initials on the back until it is 100%. Um, so sometimes a piece feels done 
and it still needs two to five hours of tweaking in between other projects. The interesting thing with metal clay is that it's it's you're not usually ever working on one piece oh. because you have to dry the pieces in between stages. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you just get a large, muddy mess. And so very often, there's four or five projects rotating off my workstation mm -hmm. into the dehydrator back out. And so it's this merry-go-round <laughs> of activity. And sometimes it's two or three of the same thing. Most of the time, it's five uniquely different pieces. Uh -huh. um, and some pieces I go in with a real clear intention. Uh, I know what I want to make. Other times it's like almost plugging into like a collective unconscious. I'm going to sit down and start working and something starts coming together and then I elaborate on it and sometimes look at it and mash it back down and start all over. I mean, that's the beauty of metal clay is that it is infinitely plastic until it is fired, meaning it, you can turn it back into usable clay until it's fired. So it's, it's not like any other medium that I've ever worked with. So you mentioned casting a couple yes. of times. Uh, what's the percentage between pieces that you make and the ones that you cast, or do you cast all of them? I can't cast all of them. Uh, some of them, the design elements don't translate well into molding mm -hmm. and casting. Certainly anything with glass in it can't be casted. A lot of it has to do with... Um, two definite differences. Certain pieces are casted for duplication, for example, to have a matching pair of earrings, mm -hmm. but also to give them durability because the metal clay is softer as fine silver and as a centered metal mm -hmm. than a cast metal, um, especially with bracelets. If I want to have a bunch of links that are all identical, uh, my fish bracelet, which is one of my favorites, uh, we made one teeny tiny fish that's, l I think, with the jump rings less than an inch long and cast 200 of them to make 28 bracelets and then have some spares to be able to make longer bracelets for clients uh -huh. with larger wrists. Um, certain designs I cast because honestly, as an art, a working artist, you think about it right now, octopi are popular. Uh -huh. So I knew that if I did an octopus that I was really proud of, that people would want it. Mm -hmm. And making that same design over and over again is a bit prohibitive. Yeah. So being able to offer, let's say, I think this was an addition of 12, out at a price that was n n not, well, considerably lower than what the original would have gone for as a one-time sale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is a big factor. And so I try to also make sure that there's an incredible variety in the cast work so that there's also then some sort of difference between, you know, these are cast, they're, these are originals. These originals. Uh -huh. Some people really love the cachet of the idea of getting something that is one of a kind. Yeah. Um, if an original sells and somebody says, oh, I really wish I could have one, I'll usually make another one. It will be subtly different. There is no way I can yeah. make an exact duplicate, but that's what makes it fun and special. That's very cool. Let's take a look at some Absolutely. more pieces. Please. Let's take a look. I know they are excited to see. This is the latest scare beetle that I did. Um, I made the glass that went into the body, and it's the first one I did where I didn't do a very simple pattern on the wings, which are the upswept pieces that are facing the 10 and 2 o'clock positions. On an insect, the wings on a beetle are actually hidden under body panels that swivel open called elytra. So the elytra have a pattern that is different than the wings, but they match the pattern on the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always had a fascination with uh, scarab beetles from Egyptian culture, uh -huh. and I started making them, and then they got increasingly more elaborate, and this one is a personal favorite. Uh, it's one I really, when it was done, I really knew I'd kind of hit that giggle factor. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Very cool. That is an older non-kinetic fish. You like fish. I love fish, because I <laughs> snorkel, and so Ooh. to me, that's the best part of snorkeling, is all, all the, the beautiful fish. colors and movement this actually is based on a beta, which are the Siamese fighting fish, because uh -huh. I love the really ornate ones with the big flowy tails. So that's what this one was based on in the design. I used to snorkel too. It's very fun. This is a, a sort of a surrealistic flower done with a piece of dichroic glass. This was before I was making my own. This was a challenging project. Yeah. I loved every minute of it, and it is... One of uh, another all time favorite in my flowers because I love the symmetry of the piece and the uh, layers of detail that there's 
a layer of detail in the bezel around the glass. There's a layer, layer of detail in the pieces below it, and then the leaves themselves or petals themselves have another texture. That's very cool. Okay, uh, Meg is saying, when did you make the transition to full-time artist, and was it easy? Well, uh, full-time artist, when did I make that transition? So my son would have been two and a half, so that was 11 years ago. I'm in a very lucky position that as a stay-at-home dad, I wasn't trying to support the family on the art mm -hmm. uh, earnings. The business basically supports itself. Um, it's gone through its ups and downs. It is not easy to make a living as a working artist. It is a constant, uh, I don't want to use the words grind and hustle because those sound negative. I like the positive attitude of sort of it, which is you have to put your heart and soul into it. You have to understand that the biggest challenge for most artists is the business side of it. It's not making the art. Yeah. It's the bookkeeping, it's the social media, it's the shipping on time, it's the tracking of receipts, it's figuring out your profits, it's figuring out all the bells and whistles. And what I encourage anybody who wants to make art a career is A, find yourself a great accountant. It, they will help you understand it. Get your business license, get your resale license, get all your ducks in a row with the business side of things. And then make sure you take equal time to stay organized on the business end of things mm -hmm. so you're not finding receipts under your bed on April 14th to get your taxes done. Yeah. Uh, organization yes. is key. I've been doing this a long time, but I still hate the business side. I will always love teaching. I will always love making art. I will always love selling art. But the realities of doing the business side... I hope one day to have an assistant to handle at least maybe a small <laughs> percentage of it because it's it's the downside of it. Yeah. And I think that's the downfall for a lot of artists is it that is. they they can make the art, but they're not business savvy at all. They usually underprice their work. They don't demand what they deserve. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to also make sure that, you know, there's a market for what you're trying to do. Yes. Um, make sure you have a side job that at least keeps the... Lights on, food in your belly, and roof over your head. I used to say that the, uh, the old idea that, you know, being a starving artist makes them so passionate that they create their best work. No. no. Artists create their best work when they're getting good sleep, they're getting well fed, yes. and they're not stressing too much. They don't have to think about bills all the yes. time, right? Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, I, I work with artists all day long, and, and it's a very true statement. It, they, many times they leave the business aside right and it only harms them Absolutely. Uh, but it's not fun i mean they think it's not fun i actually think i love business <laughs> but they think it's not fun right and, and you say oh my gosh because the potential is there the talent is there but then they fall short because yes. they don't want to look at this side now for a person that is interested in this medium yes uh tell us about the basic setup that they need the minimum that they need to get started well there are plenty of lists of basic metal clay tools. Um, I think going online to grab that list is always helpful. Mm -hmm. You can do with less. Um, obviously, you're going to need you know, some pretty basic things. Uh, we all started with playing cards to act as spacer slats, but there are color-coded slats now for rolling at specific thicknesses. I think mm -hmm. those... Your roller doesn't have to be anything fancy. I'm still using a six inch piece of PVC pipe from the hardware store. They're actually the best rollers out there. They're smooth yeah. and they're maybe 15 cents worth of PVC. Mm -hmm. A good smooth work surface. I work on a plexiglass sheet that was scrap plexiglass from one of the local plexiglass suppliers, uh -huh. you know, like a tap plastics. Um, you're gonna need something to dry the clay for beginners. They all use standard cup warmers, which you can pick up at yard sales mm -hmm. or very often even at a dollar store for a couple of bucks. Um, textures of some sort, you can start off with just a few simple textures. They come at all different prices, but I would say at least a dozen very different textures. Okay. Um, a needle tool is a necessary thing. Something to dry on. Everybody dries on different things. Some people use small glazed ceramic tiles. I use stainless steel ceramicist scrapers. They do make little 
um, Teflon sheets, mm -hmm. which are nice because then they, the piece releases off of them. They aren't easy to move pieces on because they're floppy, uh -huh. but those are really good. Uh, a small spray bottle, some small brushes. I use a number one fine red sable brush because the bristles are very soft when wet, so they won't leave marks in your clay. Uh, let me think. I'm sorry. This is kind of I'm trying yeah. to remember what my general kit is. Uh, you're going to need a small jar for slip. You're going to need something to keep the clay moist, which can simply be uh, a baby food size jar with a piece of sponge attached in the lid or in the bottom of the jar so that the clay can be kept moist between working. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest investment I do recommend is a kiln. Uh, the, the, the amount of work you can do in metal clay with a torch is somewhat limited. Yeah, the, I had a question about yeah. that, Marie Grubbs. Can you torch fire or only kiln fire? Well, uh, that's a little bit of a complicated question, but not in a bad way. If you want to do small scale pieces, if you're doing small charms, things like that, you can get away with a torch. Mm -hmm. That has to be a formula that can handle torch firing, which in the, if we're talking about metal clay, PMC is not, a, it, it's used the way Kleenex is used. It's an actual brand name, yeah. right? It's Precious Metal Clay by Mitsubishi Metals. There are several formulas of PMC and Art Clay Silver, and the field is now opened up, so I don't want to ignore any vendors that are selling other metal clays, but you have to check that those can be torch fired. The thing is, the second you want to use glass, you can't torch fire. You can't torch fire any of the sterling type clays mm -hmm. because they require a set temperature for an hour to get fully sintered. It also doesn't work well on large pieces because you can't displace the heat evenly on something by the time it starts to get larger. So the nice thing about kilns, though, is there are simpler ones. There are a few microwave kilns out there that are pretty effective. There's hot pot kilns that run off sterno, basically. And it's the one market where you can find reliable used kilns because the kilns that we use for metal clay are used for glass fusing enameling and metal clay mm -hmm. and those are things that people get into as a hobby mm -hmm. they do it for a little while they stop and the thing about a kiln is until it stops working it really doesn't lose any value okay. and i've had the same kiln for 20 years i've replaced a 35 dollar thermocouple in that period of time mm -hmm. and it's not the prettiest thing but it works this as well now as it did when it came out of the box right so I think that is really important. You will need um, beyond you know the basic toolkit. I'm sure I left a few things out. The metal clay artists out there know, are probably shaking their heads. Mike, why didn't you say this or that? You're also going to then need tools for finishing. And the basic tools for finishing are usually a brass brush, a stainless steel brush, a small container to do liver of sulfur, and then some sort of polishing pads to take the liver of sulfur off. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to do... Uh, a super bright mirror shine finish with hand tools very easily. That's you need to start thinking about tumblers, magnetic pin finishers, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's great about it though is, is if you take a class, uh, those instructors will get most students started off with the basics yeah. and tell them what the pitfalls are. There's a lot of tools out there that, that are very attractive that aren't necessary for the beginner. Mm -hmm. And there are some very accomplished metal clay artists, Anna Maison, for example, absolute minimum of tools and some of the most exquisite, smallest detailed pieces you've uh -huh. ever seen in your life. Yeah. She makes mushrooms that are smaller than a corn kernel with full details. So, yeah. And she does it with her hands and a minimum of tools. Uh -huh. And there's always a workaround for a lot of the tools too. So you don't want to buy that $10 needle tool you know, you can take a wooden dowel and drill it and stick a sewing needle in the end. And for 25 cents, yeah. you've got a needle yeah. tool. So, yeah. yeah. People think they, they tend to focus way too much on the tools, right? And that's not... Yeah, it's like people who blame their equipment for the fact that they're a lousy golfer. No, <laughs> yeah. it's you haven't taken enough golf lessons. It's not that you yeah, didn't buy exactly. the $2,000 exactly. clubs. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. I like, but well, anyway, for a person thinking about getting started, yeah. it's not a huge investment. The kiln, I know you can get them for a hundred bucks. I know. The yeah. Sum. I mean, and the thing is, is usually unless you're somewhere where there's no metal clay artists, the nice thing is a lot of 
instructors offer firing services that the same too. way uh -huh. ceramics houses do. Yes, yes. And so what you do is because there's a flat rate for firing, you save up a bunch of pieces and bring them to them for firing, and then you can do your finishing at home. Yeah. And that fee might be as low as $10. Yeah, and almost every city has yes. at least one part of your place that would do that. Pete is asking, and that's actually yeah. what I was going to ask you next. How are you, how are you dealing with being an artist during this COVID time? So, of course, shows were canceled and things like that. But on a personal side, how has this affected you? The first few weeks of COVID were brutal. Uh, I came to a dead stop, even though I had more free time than I'd had in a while. Yeah. Uh, gradually, I realized that the salvation in all of this was to get back into the studio and start making things again. Um, my studio is my happy place. Uh, there's always music playing. So I just had to kind of pry myself out of the house, get away from social media specifically and the news. Yeah. Once I shut that down and got back in the studio, at least my headspace was good. And actually, I've pushed out probably as much work during this last, let's call it nine months, uh -huh. than almost any other nine month period. And the lucky thing was is sales still kept trickling in because people were looking online more. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I have my website, I also have that, the, the, the sales end of the website is through Etsy. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I started getting Etsy-driven sales and not website-driven sales. Oh, look at that. The nice thing for me is, is that I really do try to have everything point towards my website. So when you see my stuff on Instagram, mm -hmm. it says, if you're interested, go to the website. Mm -hmm. Facebook, uh, my business page, go to the website. So it was interesting that while sales were down because the in-person sales weren't possible anymore, uh, at least during the early stages, there was enough business to kind of remind me that... You were in business. I was in business. The, the bricks and mortar store that I sell at in my hometown, Feathered Outlaw, kicked off uh, in late spring with a virtual magical market, mm. they called it. How did that work? I want to know. I didn't sell a thing because <laughs> my work doesn't translate to a, a, a visual market that hasn't seen the stuff in person before or doesn't know the work very often. We then were able, because of sort of that staged relaxation, to do outdoor true markets that was, A, it was like having the your birthday and Christmas rolled into one mm -hmm. because I was back in my element being able to talk face-to-face -to, -face to people about my work, mm -hmm. which is, even if I'm not selling, being able to tell people about the work, the process and the material makes me so happy. Mm -hmm. um, underneath my mask, I had a grin for a solid four hours. My face actually hurt at the end of that first uh -huh. magical nice, market. Nice. And we've done it the last Friday of every month uh, three or four times since, and that's been really nice. That's good. Because uh, for an artist, to create is one thing, but to meet people and to be able to talk about your art, whether it's in a gallery setting, whether it's like this, uh, but especially in an environment where people are wanting to be out, and oh, people, yeah. people were desperate to get out and see things uh -huh. and talk to people and buy some stuff. Yeah. You know, that buying online, just there's no connection the there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hate to say it, don't wait till we're dead to buy our work. You know, <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't want to be famous when I'm dead. I don't want to be successful when I'm dead. I like it while I'm still kicking and breathing yeah. and making that connection with the person buying the piece. Well, and again, with the, there is the storytelling part of these pieces because yes. they were made with that in mind. Uh, so I think it's a good thing for us to, to remember holidays are coming. Very easy to go to the online store and click, click, click the delivery next day, but you're not really supporting uh, an artist or even a local business, right? So you have to have that in mind because I think now more than ever, this yes. is important. You, uh, the, the big companies will survive no matter the crisis, uh, but the restaurants, the, the retails, the galleries, like yes. you said, and of course the artists, uh, they do need your support. All of yes, us we do. need <laughs> that, yes. So tell me, tell me one last thing. Yes, only one last thing? Uh, well, we've been here for an hour. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so we need we need to know. But uh, that that was interesting. The, yeah. the the virtual tour that you did with the that store. Yeah. Uh, was it the pieces on a website that people would go through? I or specifically I so what I did is they asked me to basically create an Etsy sale of specific pieces. Okay. The way I did it was. Everything on the website was what people were pointed to, and I picked, I think, 18 pieces that I did a discount on. Okay. It was just a weird time. I think people were still a little shell-shocked. Uh -huh. You know, people were still sort of coming out of the woodwork, figuring out what they wanted to do. Um, you know, the, the big thing is, is that, you know, it, it takes time for people to kind of get back into mm -hmm. some sense of normalcy. And, you know, the other thing, too, that's great about buying things like the things that I make, is it's not just something that's been punched out by a machine. Exactly. And so giving a gift that's personal has far more meaning. Yes. And uh, I'm going to leave you with one last thing, which is something I, you know, every artist has their patter, right? right? We have that conversation that we have with our customers. I say, it's bad enough to walk into a party and someone's wearing the same shirt. Mm -hmm. It's even worse if they're wearing the same jewelry. So if you pick <laughs> that piece up, yeah. you know, at Charming Charlie for 10 bucks, uh -huh. you're going to see it on somebody else while you're out and about. You get one of my pieces, it's probably pretty close to impossible uh -huh. that you're going to run across somebody else wearing the same exact piece. Yeah, yeah. I, I think when we buy art, it's really what we need to understand right now because uh, you buy from the artist and you're telling the artist, you matter to me. You're going to wear that piece that yeah. is unique and you're going to say, I matter. And if you give that piece to somebody, you're going to say, you matter to me. And if there's something we need right now, because, of course, we are all tired of this. And we are all anxious because we cannot foresee the future, at least, uh, you know, not all the ramifications of the future. Uh, we, we, are, we are bored. And they say, actually, 60% of the U.S. population is actually uh, experiencing depression. And, and I know that is true. Yes. I, I never stopped one day working during this whole crisis. But I can feel that I'm not the same as I used to be nine yes. months ago. So it's very, very important, you know, to reinforce Great. that you care uh, to other people and to yourself. And I think through, through handmade things, you can say that very easily. Some people don't understand. You are yeah. always going to give something that you made to somebody and they couldn't care less about it. But most will. Right, yes. And I think this is a very special year in that sense because it brings relief, of course, to the artists because you're buying something and they can keep on doing what they do. But it gives relief to you that you can do that. It gives relief to the other thinking he or she thought about me. Right, So I think our mission now is, is bigger than always because it, it has to f really force us to think about the other more than Absolutely. ever. Right. Thank you so much for being here. Thank I'm you really for having excited. Me. I had a yeah. really fun time, and I'm really looking forward to teaching you yes, next month. Yes, and you know, that, that, that's the cool part, because do you like to watch this podcast and uh, at the same time being, be live with the, the artists and be able to interact with, with the artists as well? Well, the course that he's going to give at CuriousMondo.com uh, will provide exactly that, but for a much longer time, because we have nine classes from the very beginning of the fish to the end, and all the time we are live, and it, oh, look at this, look at this, it is free for you to watch while we are live, so you can watch the whole thing for free, we don't hide any technique behind the curtain if you pay, it's there for you. Uh, you can interact the whole time, not only uh, with the artist, asking as many questions as you want, but interacting with the Curious Mondo Village, if you have not experienced that, you're in for a treat. We have a very embracing village here that supports from beginners to very experienced artists during the whole uh, time because they are on the chat talking to you. So there are many, many reasons why you need to be present for this course. Uh, it's going to happen starting November 16th. For three days, so Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, we go live at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. That's 11 
uh, a.m. Eastern time. If you're in another country, Google that. Uh, so you, you make sure you're here. The, the best thing that you can do is really go right now to CuriousMondo.com, CuriousMondo.com. Click on Upcoming Courses. And you're going to see a big picture of the fish there. Click there. Put your name and your, your email. What happens later is that you get the reminders for the class. You have only that one chance to watch live and for free. So you don't want to miss that. You don't want to forget about it because we are still a month away. So make sure you put your name and email there so we can send you the reminders and you get to watch Michael Max here in Salt Lake City for three days, uh, making the kinetic fish. I think it's going to be phenomenal to see that moving and going about. Uh, so you cannot miss that. So go to CuriousMondo.com. Click on upcoming courses, check the fish, it's a big picture. Click there and put your name and email so you get the reminders. So thank you again for thank being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very thank you much. Thank you for yeah. all your hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you everybody that is here late today. And of course, thank you for participating and you know making this even, even a better experience all the time. Join me next time and you can check many interviews uh, on creativityinfocus.com. We have over 60 interviews there for you just to spend your time. You know, if you're still staying at home, watch. You're going to be so inspired. And I'll see you back here next time. Thank you.